Shut up and sit down. Welcome to the Rebel Trading Group Podcast. My name is the gluten-free Jason Bessing. Today is January 24th, 2019, and this is episode 60 of the Rebel Trading Group Podcast. How you doing, everybody? We're having a decent market out there. It's not too bad. Things are calming down. Things are starting to look pretty pretty well, coming to the upside here. I wanted to do a podcast because it's just that time of the week, and uh, I know we've kind of slowed down on content, but rest assured, we are continuing to want to create content, but... On my end, I'm actually working a little bit more, and I've been making a few more deposits to the account because that's what it's all about, right? At the end of the day, you can only trade what you put in there, so you got to go make that money. You got to be smart. It starts with you. Pay your bills, pay your accounts, and uh, you know, stay on track. Stay, stay on it. You got to put money in in order to make more money. So, uh, that being said, we are in the midst of earnings season, and that's pretty much the only news that's out there. Um, they seem to be attaching news stories to earnings, like, oh, market's up because Apple, or I'm sorry, Apple hasn't reported yet, but um, for instance, uh, we had Procter & Gamble. Apparently, they led a market rally yesterday, somehow, with their Gillette commercial, I guess. I don't know what's going on with all that. But earnings is the news. Earnings is what's going on, what's continuing to drive this market. Uh, Government is still shut down. We still do not have an end in sight. Just arguing back and forth, and I love it. I love a good gridlock in the White House and Washington and all together. I love it. That's what I live for. I love it when politicians can't do their job just because they're idiots. Idiots in Washington. What else is going on? We have the World Economic Forum going on in Davos, or Davos, Switzerland. Uh, we got CEOs and World Economic Advisors and advisors from uh, all countries, international, uh, meeting together and discussing some of the global economic issues that are going on and what they can do to take responsibility and how they can combat them or maybe even grow them. So that's been going on. We've had a lot of... Uh, A lot of negativity that's been kind of coming out of the meeting. A lot of hedge fund managers warning of great recession and great economic downturns all across the globe, actually. Not just here in America, but all across uh, the globe. We just have a lot of political bullshit that's going on. We have uh, the EU still always continuing to struggle. Uh, We have Brexit going on, which I don't even think... Britain knows what's going on with that. They still don't have a plan in place. We have the government shut down here in the United States. We have trade talks between China and the United States. There's just, there's all kinds of uncertainty going on. And right now the free market is just kind of having to run itself. And I'm okay with that. Ah, excuse me. So not much in the way of news, nothing really exciting going on, except that we are still shut down. So let's go ahead and move on over to a market terminology today. And market terminology, very simple. What's a retail investor? Well, a retail investor is you, or me, or Nathan, or all of our friends together. Anyone that is not a legitimate certified business or institution is a retail investor. Anyone who opens their own brokerage account, their own margin account, puts money in every day or every month, whatever, those are retail investors. I wouldn't put IRA and – well, I'd put IRAers in there, but I wouldn't put the 401Kers in there because that's, that's more so just investing, not retail investing in the sense that you're picking out individually what you're uh, putting your money in. 401Kers usually have people do that for them. So the retail investor is someone who goes out there, picks their own stocks, their own funds, grows their own money on their own. 
why retail? I have no clue. I don't know why I'm retail investor. Uh, it's it's a confusing term because right off the bat, a lot of people think people who invest in retail, like J.C. Penney or Macy's or Amazon, and quite frankly, that's not the case. So it's a misnomer, I think they call those. So retail investor, you and me, the average Joes, no hedge funds, no no one that can move a market pretty much. So that's your retail investor. Very simple, right? So when you see that pop up on CNBC, but oh yeah, yeah, Jason was talking about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, today, I just wanted to put out a quick little episode. So I want to talk about earnings. Now we just did an episode together a couple days ago about the earnings season that we are currently in the midst of. Uh, last week, the banks reported, and that's usually the first signs to kick off the earnings season. So I want to talk about earnings themselves. What happens to stocks? And you'll probably note that more times than not, stocks go down on earnings. Even when stocks beat, they go down. So what is this? Why are they why do they always go down? Well, there's many a factors, so let's kind of break it down. First of all, we know Earnings is broken down into earnings per share. That way, it's easy to, it's an easier metric of how to measure the money that's able to be generated on a per share basis, rather than just say, "Oh yeah, Procter and Gamble made a hundred million this quarter." We don't really know exactly what that means. It doesn't give us as good of a picture. But if you have the stock price and they say, oh, we made $1.10 per share, and you have a $60 stock, that's, oh, okay, 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 price multiple of six, of a, well, no, if that was per quarter, no, price multiple of about 15, yeah, that's about right. Anyway, um, so we know that it's broken down into a earnings per share basis. So a lot of times we'll see uh, earnings estimates come in, um, let's say $1.12. And then someone comes out, we made $1.17, and then the stock will go down 4%. So you'll see a beat on earnings, and then you'll just see negativity on the stock. Maybe it sells 4, 5, 6, 7%. Uh, this is because you need to look at the broader scope than just the earnings number. Also, what's, re- what's reported with that earnings number is the revenue for that quarter. And revenue is a little bit different than earnings. Revenue is the money that was brought in. And sometimes revenue can go up or down regardless of earnings. So let's say, for example, we have that $1.12 stock that came in at $1.17, right? They made $850 million in revenue, but they were supposed to make $875 million in revenue. So that means that they beat on earnings, but the money it cost more money to get those earnings. I don't know if that really makes sense. It's kind of it's kind of hard to explain it a little simpler than that. I'm trying to think of some like an example. Um, I guess let's let's say you have a restaurant that makes tons of money one quarter, right? But in order to make tons of money, you had to hire 10 more staff, you had to buy another fridge, you had to increase your hours, and your water bill went up. So therefore, the costs to make that more money were higher. And that's not necessarily a strong sign for investors, because if you know, it's, it's about increasing revenue and increasing earnings and increasing profits. So... In order for a stock to go up, you need to have not only a beat on earnings, but a beat on revenue. And even then, the stock may not go up. It may still go down. Sometimes it's what's in the earnings call that happens just a few minutes after they release the earnings report. It's what the CEO, the CFO, the COO, all these big chiefs, it's all about the bullshit that comes out of their mouth that is going to drive uh, the Wall Street investors. So 
usually they will say that they are on track to meet estimates throughout the year. They will raise their guidance and say, hey, we think we're going to make more money this year than what was expected. Or they might say, I think we're going to make less money than what's expected. And when the CEO says that, you can guess what's going to happen to that stock. So let's say you have a beat all across. You have beat on earnings and a beat on revenue. And then the CEO comes out and says, hey, we did really good this quarter because this brand of XYZ dildos did really good. And we are going to uh, make more money this quarter. Or uh, not this quarter, this year. Investors like to hear that. That gives them comfort. Therefore, that will cause the price to go up. But sometimes CEOs will be straightforward. They say, hey, it's going to be an ugly year for us because maybe steel prices are going up and you're a home builder. Steel and lumber is, is getting more expensive and the housing market slowing. So you say, hey, I think we're going to play it more conservative and we're not going to make as much as we expected. That's going to cause the stock to go down. So you kind of want to take in those three metrics, but definitely take in the earnings and you want to take in the actual, uh, uh, you want to take in the actual revenue and they're commonly reported together. Anytime you try to look up or follow one of your, um, stocks and you look at the earnings for that quarter, you'll see the revenue posted with it. And then, you know, you're free to call in and listen to the investor presentation and the earnings call. You're more than welcome to do that. You're a shareholder. You have that fucking right. Um, uh, unless you have a finance degree, you probably won't know most of what they're talking about. Unless you work in that industry. Um, for example, I always use host hotels as a resort. HST. One of my favorite stocks of all time. Currently have a small position in it. But... Um, one of the reasons I like this one and hotels in general is because I, it was part of my degree in college. I have a minor in hospitality management and I read a lot of shit about hotels and how they operate and how they report their numbers and how, uh, how they stay profitable and all that shit. Rev par, block rooms, room rack rates. Stuff like that. I understand those. So when the CEO comes on and talks about some of the metrics that are key to that industry, I get it. And if it's a restaurant, I've worked in restaurants most of my adult life. I understand a lot of what they're talking about. Food sales, slowing traffic. I cannot hop onto Netflix's or a semiconductor stock and listen to, a, to, to their research and I, I can't do it. I don't get it. Or a software development company. So, get those, get on those earnings calls. Listen to what those CEOs say. Do a little bit of just extra research. Extra research. And have a strong head when you're going into the earnings season. So, what can you do to protect yourself? Because we do know that there is more likely to be a sell-off on an earnings call than there is a run-up on an earnings call. So what can you do to protect yourself? Well, you can put those hedges on. You can short some of the stock. You can buy out-of-the-money put options. That way, if the stock just collapses, you can profit on the downside. I actually did that yesterday on Ford Motor Company's earnings. I have 100 shares around the 850 range, and I bought an 8 put. Now, luckily, it didn't work out for me, and the stock didn't plummet. So I lost the $7 for the put, but my 850 stayed safe. So I bought some insurance on it by buying an out-of-the-money put. In addition to that, I had also sold the covered call, so whatever. Uh, but point being, you can put on an insurance bet. But you're going to lose all your money. It's going to cut into your gains. You don't want to... <sighs> you buy car insurance... Every month, you pay for it. At least in Florida, it's the fucking law. You don't go out on the road hoping you get into a wreck, though. And that's the same thing as this. I buy a little bit of insurance on my portfolio, just just in case. Just in case. I don't hope it 
profits because if it profits, that means everything else is going down. So you can buy a little insurance through puts. That's my favorite way, and I honestly think that is the only and the best way to hedge your holdings is by buying out-of-the-money puts in case of some sort of freak crisis that can cover you on a 6, 7, 8, 9% dip on a shitty earnings call. What you can also do is you can just wait until after the earnings call and after the earnings go down. And then, once the stock crashes, you go ahead and load up on more of your favorite stock. The only problem is is you're going to have to probably look at a longer-term outlook for it. So, that's just a couple things you can do. I just wanted to answer that question about why do stocks always go down in earnings? Like, I, a lot of novices will think, oh, they beat on earnings, the stock's going to go up. And it's really... Not true in the slightest. It's nowhere close to that. You've got to get a better look at the bigger picture. So I don't play earnings. I don't go in and do these crazy straddles and strangles. Occasionally, I'll insure some of my positions, but I don't. I just I don't like to touch them. Option prices are inflated because there is more implied volatility on the line. Uh, During those times and um, I just I don't I don't like to just I don't like to take bets. I like to buy things when they're on sale. I don't like to take bets when it comes to stocks. So I prefer to buy the dip than go directional or strangle or straddle because I've too many times been burned on those inflated premiums. So I don't recommend playing earnings. I recommend watching them and reacting after them. So I'm not really watching anything this week. I uh, currently pausing on my trades and my. I'm gonna let my cash chill, and I'm kind of waiting for this. The uncertainty in this market, I'm trying to just waiting for it to kind of shake off and see where we go because I feel like we haven't really done much since that huge run up uh, at the beginning of the, the first week of the month. We haven't done too much. We've trickled upward, but I don't know if it's legit. I'm holding off. I'm waiting on the sidelines. Um, I guess you can say I will continue to watch HST. And I don't. I want to pick her up at a lower price. I don't like it at seventeen nineteen. I like it at seventeen. I love it in the sixteens. It looks like a nice double bottom right around. No, I wouldn't even call that a double bottom. Nah, I lied. There's no bottom there. That chart's lying to me. But if you could pick this bitch up in the sixteens, I'm excited. I'm excited. Five percent dividend. I will take it. So. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, suggestions, insults, ideas, corrections, anything, if you have anything for us, you can email us, rebeltradinggroup at gmail.com. That's rebeltradinggroup with two Gs at gmail.com. We are on iTunes. Subscribe to us. We are on YouTube. All of our videos will always be there for free for you always iTunes, YouTube, we are on SoundCloud, Facebook, we are on Stock Twits. I love the old Stock Twits. Love it. So, uh, get at us. Find us. Join the discussion. And if you want to be on the show, let us know in an email. We'll ask you a few questions about yourself, and we'd love to have you on talk about your tra- your trading strategies, some of your best stories, and just kind of get to know some of the other traders that are out there. So, Thanks for listening, guys. Thanks for uh, staying with me during this short episode. Stay tuned. We're going to get some more content out soon. We're busy, guys, but we do love you. Thanks again, and happy trading.
Shut up and sit down.